So today, I want to tell you a story. It is a story that practitioners of dynamic mode decompositions tell everybody. And this story is the parable of Koopman modes. Special present. What is it? Open it up. A book? That's right. And this is a special book. It was the book my father used to read to me when I was sick, and I used to read it to your father. And today I'm going to read it to you. Got any sports in it? Are you kidding? Fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. Doesn't sound too bad. I'll try and stay awake. We've talked about dynamic mode decomposition. Last time I gave you a nice breakdown of what DMD is and what it's trying to accomplish, where basically it is a way of taking a look at your signal and trying to get a representation of it by taking advantage of the fact that you know it's dynamic or that there's some sort of underlying differential equation or underlying discrete time dynamics that will generate your signal. And so if you use this, then we can interact with things like the Koopman operators, the Leoville operators, and other operators in order to get a nice spectral breakdown of those operators, and then we can use that to rebuild our signal. And so I've given you uh, at least two different algorithms to take a look at you know, dynamic mode decomposition with. Uh, one exploited the Koopman operator with regular kernels, and another used the Leoville operator, but with occupation kernels. The difference between those two is that Koopman operators have to assume that continuous time dynamics are actually discretizable. So this means that we're looking for dynamics that are what are called forward invariant. And if we want to drop that assumption, then you can work with Leoville operators directly and at the cost of using occupation kernels, which isn't really that much of a cost. They're actually special built to handle dynamical systems arising from first order differential equations. So then what is the goal of DMD? Why don't we just review this real quick? The idea is that we're taking a signal and we're doing all these finite rank representations of these larger operators using them. And the, the idea is that if we get an eigen decomposition of either the Koopman operators or the Leoville operators, we can go ahead and build a representation of our full state observable. And through this representation, by using these eigenfunctions, we're gonna have a whole bunch of vector valued weights. And these vector valued weights we call Koopman modes, Leoville modes, or more generally, dynamic modes. And the whole parable that we tell you is that these exist, and that they're actually a well-founded thing to go looking for. And I'm gonna tell you that's not always true. So now let's talk about when it is true. If your Koopman operator or your Leoville operator actually manifests as a self-adjoint operator, then we have a whole bunch of theorems from spectral theory that tell you that you should get an orthonormal basis that diagonalizes your operator. And we've even seen that this can work for unbounded operators, where in quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger operator that represents the quantum harmonic oscillator actually is diagonalizable by the Hermite functions. So when you have an orthonormal eigenbasis coming from a self-adjoint operator, then you do have well-defined Koopman modes. What you do is you take your full state observable and you take each one of those individual components that are just sort of represent the first dimension of your state, the second dimension of your state, etc. You take each one of these and you take the error inner product against an element of your orthonormal basis, then that is the Koopman mode after you stack it for dimension one, two, three, four, etc. And then you make a vector out of it, that is the Koopman mode. Leoville mode or even the uh, dynamic mode, more generally. And so what does this require? Well, it requires this orthonormal basis. And orthonormal eigenbases come from self-adjoint operators or normal operators. And if you don't have self-adjointness or normality of your operators, and normality means that you commute with your adjoint and self-adjoint means that you are your adjoint. If you don't have these ideas, then it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna have an orthonormal basis. So why don't we go ahead and talk about three different examples of Leoville operators that are gonna give completely different collections of eigenbases. And these are so simple to talk about. These are the Leoville operators that correspond to the dynamics f of x is equal to one, f of x is equal to x, and f of x is equal to x squared. So these are three different 
leave lock pairs that we're going to be taking a look at. And they're super simple. We're going to restrict ourselves down to just one dimension. And I'll be able to show you there are completely different properties for each one of these operators. I promise I will not kill you until you reach the top. That's very comforting. But I'm afraid you'll just have to wait. I could give you my word as a Spaniard. I've known too many Spaniards. Is there any way you'll trust me? Nothing comes to mind. I swear on the soul of my father, Domingo Montoya. You will reach the top alive. Throw me the rope. So I'm going to be looking at each of these operators, which I only sort of formally give you because I haven't actually given you the vector space that we're working over. And so in this case, we're working over the exponential dot product kernel space. And so this is a space that corresponds to the exponential dot product kernel, the e to the x times y. Now, this space is easily described. It is basically the space of all power series where the coefficients of the power series are L2 summable after multiplication by n factorial. So that means that these coefficients have to be decreasing very, very fast. And this space is actually directly connected to the Gaussian RBF space, just through a conjugation. Let's talk about the best of these operators, and that is going to be one that corresponds to f of x is equal to x. And so this is a densely defined operator, and it turns out that it is actually self-adjoint. What we have is we have two operations. We have a differentiation, and then we're following that by multiplication. For the Fox space, or the exponential dot product kernel space, the adjoint of multiplication by x is differentiation with respect to x. Symmetrically, the adjoint of differentiation by x is multiplication by x. So we know that the adjoint of this operator is actually itself. And I believe this is the only self-adjoint liable operator over the exponential dot product kernel space. And so that might actually be a little alarming for you. So if you change the space, then you change the dynamics that give you self-adjoint liable operators or even self-adjoint Koopman operators. And so you have to be very, very careful here about the kernels you select and what you expect out of them. Now, how are we gonna find the eigenfunctions for this? Well, it's very, very simple. Since this is just a single variable case, we can actually turn this into a separable differential equation. So we are looking for an eigenfunction, we'll call it phi, for this operator. And so we're looking for something that, where we have phi prime of x times f of x is equal to lambda times phi of x. And so if we want to solve that, that is just regular ODEs. We go ahead and we divide both sides by phi, and we divide both sides by f, and then you integrate. Now on the left hand side, we're going to end up with the natural log of the absolute value of phi of x. And this is going to be equal to uh, the antiderivative of lambda over f of x. Now through a little bit of analysis reasoning using continuity and analytic functions, we can drop the absolute values off of the phi of x after we exponentiate. So ultimately what we end up getting is that we get phi of x should be equal to e raised to the antiderivative of lambda over f of x. And since we know that f of x is just x, we're gonna end up getting e to the lambda times the natural log of x, uh, neglecting the constant from anti-differentiation. And so ultimately you get that phi of x should be equal to just x to the lambda. So now what can we do with that? x to the lambda isn't actually gonna be inside of our reproduced kernel helper space for every lambda. And in fact, we need to make sure that we end up getting an analytic function at the end of the day. So what we have to do is we have to select the, the lambda that are gonna give us a well-defined analytic function from say negative infinity to infinity on our real line. And well, it turns out that the only ones that are actually gonna work out here are gonna be the lambdas that correspond to integer values. And so phi of x is equal to x to the m, where m is an integer, or well, a, a non-negative integer. Now we could have actually worked that out earlier. We don't have to go through all that rigmarole, but it informs us how to do it for the other examples too. Now, so what do we have? We know that this is a self-adjoint operator, so all these phi's should actually be orthogonal to each other if we have different m's, and certainly that's true. It turns out that in the exponential dot product kernel space, x to the m is orthogonal to x to the m prime, where m and m prime are different. And if you want to normalize them, then you just need to divide by the square root of m factorial. So in this case, we actually end up with Koopman modes. Like I said, if you have an orthonormal basis, then you have Koopman modes. And so the dynamics f of x equal to x give you a Koopman mode and ta-da, done. And so I guess there's not much else to talk about there now that we figured out what the orthonormal basis is. 
And so now let's go on to the next example. And this one is a lot simpler. It is f of x is equal to one. I do not mean to pry, but you don't by any chance happen to have six fingers on your right hand. Do you always begin conversations this way? So how do we find the eigenfunctions for this label operator? Again, we turn to differential equations. This is simply a separable differential equation that we need to solve. And so all we need to do is we take a look at phi prime of x times one is equal to lambda times phi of x. And well, I mean, I don't even need to tell you how to solve that one. That gives you e to the lambda times x. That's I mean, that's the first thing you learn in differential equations, right? So piece of cake. Okay, so for what lambda does that actually end up working out? Well, remember these are real valued functions over the real line. And so if I plug in a number in there, I better get a real number back. What you end up getting is that lambda has to be real because if it's imaginary, we're gonna have some oscillating imaginary part going along this real line. And so that's a problem. So then that is our eigenbasis. And it's actually a complete eigenbasis. You can take any function from your exponential dot product kernel space, and you can end up approximating it by a limit of finite linear combinations of these functions. But there aren't any Koopman modes to settle on. And the reason why is because these functions at our eigenbasis aren't actually orthogonals to each other. As you add on more and more basis functions in your finite linear combinations that are approximating, say, your full state observable, then you're gonna completely change the weights that came with the previous functions. And you can see that these aren't orthogonal just because they're actually the kernel functions of our space. If I take lambda and mu as, as different eigenvalues, and I attach them to these eigenfunctions, if I take the inner product of e to lambda x times e to the mu x, then that result is just evaluating e to the lambda x at mu. So that is gonna give us e to the lambda times mu. And since lambda and mu are real valued, then basically that means we're putting a real value into the exponential function and we know that the exponential function is never vanishing. So that means that they're never gonna be orthogonal to each other. What ends up happening is that as you keep increasing the number of functions that you're approximating with, then these weights end up changing and they never actually settle. And so you can't write this as a series. So there are no proper Koopman modes or label modes or dynamic modes in this case. And so there you go. You have to throw the, the Koopman mode, dynamic mode out the window. Of course, for any finite collection of our eigenfunctions, you will get weights that are unique based on the projection. It's just you have a problem when you add a new basis function to it. And that's really just where you're left. The best you can do is you can show that the full state observable is a limit of finite linear combinations of these eigenfunctions. And where you get the weights for those finite linear combinations through a projection. And that is the best possible approximation you can do for every single finite linear combination. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. Now this last example is probably the easiest one to go through and that's just because it's a disaster. And so this is just looking at the dynamics f of x is equal to x squared. And if you take a look at an, uh, the eigenfunction equation, if we're trying to solve it, then basically you're trying to solve phi prime of x times x squared is equal to lambda times phi of x. And that leads you to phi of x should be equal to e to the lambda times one over x, just through that differential equation set that we had before. And well, what you can see there is that that is a function that is not continuous on the real line. And in fact, it has what we call an essential singularity. And that can't be in our exponential dot product kernel space because our space consists of analytic functions, which means that it consists of continuous functions, and this isn't even continuous. So this is an example where you have no eigenfunctions at all. And so that's where you're left. All right, so that is the parable of dynamic modes. And hope you enjoyed it. If you wanna see more stuff like this, then please subscribe and like the video, comment, and do all that good stuff. And otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. The end. Now I think you ought to go to sleep. Maybe you could come over and read it again to me tomorrow. As you wish. <laughs>